A big part of my philosophy on being an artist is constantly learning and evolving. And that means constantly trying new things. One of these new things is Adobe Fresco. I've been experimenting with it with my iPad Pro recently. There's many cool things about it, but I want to highlight one that really stood out to me, and that's, of course, the brushes. I'm also told that it has the largest ecosystem of any digital brushes, have new and updated quarterly brushes by Kyle T. Webster, who, for those of you that don't know, is an incredible illustrator himself, but also a celebrated brush maker. They're based on the Photoshop brush engine, which, you know, it's Photoshop. It's super powerful and reliable and highly customizable for shape, size, and texture. They also have their live brushes, which is super cool, especially the blooming watercolors and creamy oil paint. I heard that there's going to be a freemium model so anyone can try it out. Look out for the release coming soon. If you're coming to Lightbox Expo, come by the Adobe booth at 1203 and try it out. I'm proud to have Adobe coming to Lightbox Expo, and on behalf of Lightbox Expo, I want to thank them for their sponsorship. Welcome to Schoolism Interviews with your host, Bobby Chu. At the time of this interview, Max Ulichny had been at the multidisciplinary design studio Elastic for about 14 years. And although he loved his work and the people he worked with, he decided it was time for his next challenge. In this podcast, he recounts to Bobby the experience that brought on his career move, what he's looking forward to next, and his exciting, rewarding, and sometimes anxiously unpredictable life as an artist. We hope you enjoy it. Your personal art is, I would say, it's definitely not just at a professional level for, say, the animation industry, working on big movies or games and such, um, but it's high up there. Mm -hmm. So why don't you do that for a living? That's very kind. Well, thanks for having me. I, I so appreciate it. I've been you know, a fan of your work for a long time as well. Um, so... Funny thing, I, I'm actually in a bit of a career transition at the moment, or leading up to one. Um, I've been at Elastic, or, or you know, one of its companies, its sort of sister companies, uh, A52 and Elastic, for 14 years, ever since I moved to LA. And so I'm on my way out. Um, I'm transitioning into searching for studio work. So that is the the current uh, state of my career. I'm in kind of like, you know, for someone who's been in one place for 14 years, this is a major milestone so that's the uh the next step for sure wow it was there is that a big decision for you something that kind of dragged on for a while because it is quite a big change in your whole entire career your life it's huge um i you know I, as with any place after 14 years you're going to have ups and downs and everything else and i thought about it off and on over the years you know I, the, the people there are like family really i mean i grew up there i was 23 when i started there <laughs> so um it's kind of it's a hard thing to, to peel yourself away from and you know because i've got so many close friends there and you know like i thought about it over the years many times whether it's different studios or like commercial studios or um studio work it just i don't know it was always sort of balanced by the fact that next cool job coming up and loving the people you work with that you work with it was never an easy decision and, and even now it was really hard but it was just you know at a certain point you just realize that like you just the threshold tipped and like you can't help but just understand it that way and it wasn't anything that the studio did wrong i think it was just i think one of the inciting things and it's not like it was a major major um nothing specific happened but it was i went to ctn last year i tabled at ctn with some friends last year and uh i'd been there at, you know as a guest many times and enjoyed it but it was a funny thing because i felt i don't know like i said i've been there i've been i feel like on the outside of the industry a little bit looking in, um, you know, my personal work was what it was, whatever it was, but the, uh, I never felt like I was in that community in quite the same way. And so, you know, I knew my work was, was competitive with some of it, but it just never felt like, I don't know. I always felt like I, like I was on the outside looking in. And so when I went there and got greeted by people I looked up to and, um, had fans coming up to me, I, I mean, just like, I know I have followers and stuff, but like, it's weird to have fans in person 
What that feel how, like? It, that that must have been your one of your first experiences having that. Right? Yeah, like I, you know, I talked to him online and everything else, and that's been incredibly gracious and lovely. And um, but CTN was was a moment where I was like, oh, I. I'm not on the outside of this necessarily. Like I, I didn't feel so far removed as I thought I did. Um, so it felt a little bit like a homecoming in a certain way that was hard to describe. Um, and so that just sort of got the gears turning. Um, and then I got a couple offers shortly after, and I don't even know if it was directly related. Um, How I'm was sure it like it signing autographs? Was it the first time <laughs> signing autographs? I wasn't exactly signing autographs. I wouldn't say there was a lot of that. But I had pe people who wanted their photo with me and were like, oh, my God, I came here just for you. And that, I mean, that's still ridiculous to me. I don't know how to, you know, square that in my brain. But then people who, you know, like I just met people whose work I really loved and they liked my work. And it was validating in a way that I didn't think I needed. <laughs> um, but it was really nice to have. And so I was like, I don't know. And then, you know, like I said, I got a couple offers shortly after that I probably can't specifically talk about, but some studio offers that were nice, but circumstances or, or just one thing or another didn't quite fit. Um, and so it was like, oh, I guess I, I guess I can do this. You know, I had been turning away sort of like commercial offers for a while just because, you know, if I'm going to work in commercials, I love Elastic and I don't see it getting better necessarily for me. Um, but studio work is is different. And I think it's also part of like a work-life balance thing that I'm trying to improve on. Um, you know, commercial work is high stakes, fast moving and long hours, or at least it has been earlier in my career, especially. Um, so it's kind of a thing that I was trying to resolve. Well, you know, so that's why it's studio work, I'm hoping anyway, is a little bit better balance. Before we get too far into it, you know, you brought up your work, mm -hmm. Elastic, uh, a couple yeah. of times. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that don't know what Elastic does. Sure. And of sure. course, like we mentioned the, the end credits for Ant-Man, mm -hmm. uh, which you were involved in. Um, there's also your, that studio also did the Game of Thrones credits. Yes. And just redid them for the last season and they were unbelievably good. I mean, that was, I, I didn't personally work on it, but Kirsch and Tani and, uh, Ian Rufus and, and a lot of the team, uh, like the longtime crew at the studio were, um, I've been working on that for what eight seasons now and so that was i mean we were young men then you know <laughs> we were uh that was our, i think one of our first v-ray jobs as well and so like it turned out incredibly well the first time i mean obviously it was a cultural touchstone you know it was the simpsons did it right they ripped on it for their couch gag um but so i mean that became of, a major thing in terms of credits like uh if you're yeah. able to do any credits for anything like you know oh my god incredible it yeah it doesn't totally. get any better yeah big movie like one of the big marvel movies or yeah. game of thrones like that's that's awesome so i want to ask uh, here for time to work yeah i want to ask what did you do uh for these 14 or maybe not for all the 14 years i'm sure yeah. your roles have changed it's but a lot, yeah. what do you what do you do currently for elastic so currently I'm an art director, director, um, but I started in like as a junior CG generalist, mostly like modeling and lighting. Um, it was, uh, but yeah, like lately my day to day is art direction and, and a, a bit of directing. And there. what does that kind of look like uh, to the, the people out there that that might not understand? Sure. Um, so I'm in, often involved in the pitch phase. Um, so you know you'll get director boards uh, or you know a pitch deck. Um, from a client. And these days there's a lot of studio work, of course, with titles, or um, sometimes we pitch and work on um, some film sequences, sort of more, I don't know what I'd describe it as, kind of like creative stuff. It's not like VFX, um, you know, it's not like special effects for the films necessarily. Usually it's, it's more um, creative, uh, kind of on the animation side of things. Um, there's obviously a blend, of course. But the, um, we, we just, uh, so I'll get the pitch deck. Um, I'm always, painting frames for it almost, you know, if I'm involved, I'm painting frames on it. Um, that's character design. That's mostly style frames. I think especially at the pitch phase, we're not going into the nitty gritty character design in every case. Um, you know, it's kind of like amorphous. We pitch a lot of ideas and then we'll nail it down throughout the, um, the production if we win the pitch. But, you know, um, we'll send out a deck with, you know, kind of a range of styles. And then um, if we win the job, oftentimes I will, then lead the job in the CG department. Um, and so 
as an art director, I, I used to do more of the CG lead stuff that for most of my career, and so like CG supervisor kind of aspect. Um, as art director, I'm sometimes working with the CG supervisor as well now, so um, I'm not necessarily involved in all the technical decisions, and I'm more on the creative side. So like painting style frames or color keys for, um, or like color scripts for the sake of uh, lighters or doing paint overs for modelers. Um, so there's a lot of kind of guiding the team along the way and also just keeping, you know, spirits up and keeping everybody on task and watching schedules and getting on phone calls and all that kind of like, you know, all the fun stuff, stuff, right? Stuff. Yeah, all exactly. the fun yeah. stuff. All the stuff that you get into the industry for, right? So, you know, speaking of industries, you're mentioning you were at CTN, <clears throat> yeah. uh, met a bunch of people, felt like you found your tribe kind of thing. A little bit, yeah. September, you're going to be going up a couple notches, coming right. to Lightbox, which I'm very right. excited about. And I'm I was sure. thrilled to hear about this. It, it, it's exactly what I wanted, for sure. It, it's like, it, you know, no, no, not throwing stones or anything, but it was just the, uh, this is the, the, if I could imagine a version of a con that I would want to attend and be a part of, this is absolutely it, 100%. Like the people that you got, it, it's, it's, it's so exciting to me. Because like, it's also the people that I, for a long time, it, like when I was in high school and college and stuff, I wanted to be a comic book artist. So the fact that there's a little bit of a blend um, in that spectrum, I think of myself in sort of, you know, a, a spectrum of like animation and film and comic books and something like that. You know, that's what my interests are. And so the fact that this seems to be like right along those lines, it's really exciting to me. So do you know most of the people coming or do you know mo or do you know mm -hmm. of them? Like I know of them. I, you know, like I said, I've been kind of outside looking in for a long time. I'm hopefully, you know, fixing that or, the, you know. So which, like which, that. which names, just out of curiosity, which are the people that you're kind of the most uh, eager to meet? Uh, Mike Mignola, for sure. Uh, Crash McCreary, I was actually really excited to see that you were bringing on. He was, the, he's the reason I, um, I ever got into CG, you know, and wanted to be in film for a long time. I mean, that's huge. Like he, uh, his Jurassic Park book, and his work on Jurassic Park, but the Jurassic Park art book was, um, that was by my side for years when that came out. I was, <laughs> I was 13, I think. Uh, I don't know if that's right. It's something like that when I, when the book came out. And I, uh, man, I just poured over that thing. I did master copies. I did um, all this stuff and that. Like, that was the first time I think I, I connected it really directly was someone drew this and then someone made this you know, and, and it ended up on film. Like, that was the first time I think I had a proper understanding of, like, the full spectrum of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and it was also like, CG wasn't really, you know, it was just changed. up and coming then. So it wasn't even that like, I wanted to do, like, monster makeup and, like, the whole, like, special effects kind of end of things. And then, of course, that melted into CG as, I, as my career sort of became more, um, I don't know, realized, I suppose. And so um, that was... Uh, I don't know. That was just a moment for me. That book was important to me in a way that other books hadn't been yet. Totally. You know, that was just really, really cool. And so, like, that was, I was really excited to, I, I'm, I will geek out on him as much as he lets me. So, I'll, I'll be excited to, to see him. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, come find me and I'll, I'll introduce you. That would be amazing. If anything. Yeah. yeah. One of my artistic heroes as well. Big Absolutely. time. Big time. Oh, my God. So incredible. And like, and then his work on Rango and stuff was really cool too. So, you know, I mean, like the fact that he's got the range he does is really exciting. <laughs> uh, a little, little side note. He was one of the Raptors. He was in the suit. Are you kidding me? I did not know that. Yes. <laughs> oh man. That's funny. That's really funny. How cool is that to actually <laughs> be inside of your imagination? That's pretty incredible. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it's like uh, one of the kitchen scenes. That's so far. Oh, that's the perfect one to be in too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How good is that? Actually, I'll, I'll tell you what, the closest thing I ever, I ever came to having that kind of experience when it wasn't that, but we did um, a series of spots for Arrowhead Water. Uh, it was like five spots, I think. And it was this incredible uh, pipeline that we had. We did, we worked with New Deal Studios who worked on Inception and they did all like the miniatures and they also did like the Dark Knight uh, miniatures and stuff. Um, we did practical miniature backgrounds for that with CG characters made to look like stop motion. And it was such a cool pipeline. It was really, really fun. But we got to, you know, I was doing concept art and environment design and things on that and character design. But we got to go to this, to do a studio visit in the giant warehouse. 
And, you know, they had my concept art here and then physical miniatures of like this tree and, um, and stores and stuff. And it was like, it broke my brain. I, it was the kind of thing. It was like, it felt like I was flipping through that Jurassic Park book again, where they had the art and the, and the sculpture and it got it, like, it touched me in a way that I, <laughs> I like, I was like emotional that day in a way that I hadn't been in the industry before. And it was just so cool. And everybody was like, so incredibly nice. And they're like, oh, this is such a cool detail. And I'm look, look, look what I'm doing. The modelers were like so excited to show me things. Oh man, it was, it was incredible. Like that was just walking around these sets that I, that I'd helped design was, was, uh, I don't know. It was impactful. That was the, that was really cool. Kind of surreal. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was beginning my career, even before I was, before I knew I was beginning a career, I was in toy design mm. and I was designing toys for, uh, you know, big licenses, generally movies, right? So like designing some Star Wars toys, some cool. Pixar toys and things like that. And that's, you know, I'm working on this stuff and I'm, I get to get some of that artwork that nobody's seen yet, right? Yeah, that comes yeah. to you. You get a lot of that. That's pretty exciting. Right. And you start checking out all this new artwork or this cool movie that's hasn't even come out yet. Yeah. And it got me really excited and started to dream about being on the other side yeah making the stuff yeah that was somewhat uh similar to you absolutely yeah it's such a funny thing it's like um like we did a bunch of stuff for fantastic beasts a couple of years ago that i was really proud of i think that's a, that to, to this date i think it's probably the best stuff i've done um it was like fantastic beast there was one in particular um uh that was really beautiful and it was like we um we had a long time to work on it warner brothers were super cool it was for um uh, Pottermore and kind of specifically so it was Pottermore and it but it also tied into Fantastic Beast and like gave some backstory of the history of magic in America and so we got to actually create characters to extend the the Harry Potter lore I mean that's incredible that's as a fan that's um, so great but they you know we got concept art um, for the film because we had to you know do various promotional things with it for other stuff too um, and we had the creature designs and stuff and they were it was insane this stuff is beautiful I and mean, you know like it's the stuff on film looked beautiful but like the the work the art was just gorgeous and it was detailed and and like expressive and fun and it was like that's that's the thing is like i love remixing other people's stuff you know that's a lot of my job is is like um you know interpreting the work that we get from like film studios into like uh, promotional films and whatever it is we do but like you know, I want to be at the source, you know, I think, I think, we, I, I, you know, that's where I want to get to. And, and just because it was like, like, there's, you know, it sounds I don't know, arrogant, maybe, but it's like, I think I can do that. You know, I like, I think I'm good enough to do that. So I'm hoping that's like the, the near future will prove me right on that. And I'll just be like a crushing ego blow, but we'll see. That's, yeah, that's not arrogant at all. I, I could see how you could think that because I'm sure there was a time when I thought that. But looking at your art and hearing you say that, I feel like, wow, that sounds crazy because you're <laughs> totally there. And Thank you. you, it's almost like you don't even know it yet. And I wonder where that kind of comes from, you know? Um, oh, just general life insecurities? <laughs> perhaps. You know, I, and I'm, I'm saying that with the utmost respect as well because uh, that's something that a lot of artists especially can totally relate to. I, I was just watching the Kim Smith interview, in fact, and she mentioned imposter syndrome. And it's like, yeah, I, I think it's just true of most artists. But I think it's also like when you work for or are trying to get work with a studio and you, and you see these beautiful end products and you realize that it's messy before you see the, the polished end product. I mean, our stuff is, you know, like everything is before it looks perfect, you know? So it's like, I think you just get used to thinking um, everybody's just flawless. I, I don't know, for just recently, I was looking at someone's artwork, like on Instagram, you know, like uh, I think a lot of people put up just like loose sketches and things. I love looking at that stuff. Personally, I'm more attracted to like master's studies of their beautiful like Renaissance paintings or something. I love like my, Michelangelo's pencils or Conte is or whatever there. I love looking at him explore and goof on stuff. You know, I think that's really exciting because it makes him human in a way that like a gigantic, you know, I don't know, fresco or whatever isn't like, that's not a person up there. That's a finished piece of this impossible to imagine work, right? But I can picture sketching. I can feel 
sketching and like that makes them human to me that's incredible to me also sketching um, is kind of like you're seeing the thoughts yeah behind. and it's not necessarily about the finished product it's not even about the shape it's just like getting loose you're bookmarking ideas you know and so like just recently someone whose work i really look up to posted a sketch that i was like that's not great and, and, and but i i like seeing that and i like the transparency of them putting that out there i thought that was really cool and it's not like it was a brave thing but it was like i have to even check my own instincts because I like i think so much of that is like where i think oh man i'm just not worthy i'm not there yet but it's like no you know it's just because i'm i'm privy to all of my foibles and all my challenges all my bad sketches that ended up before the finished piece that looks pretty good let me let me ask you this max yeah. um you have art books yeah sure i'm sure you do uh yeah. Are you at the point, or have you gotten to a point where you look at some of your older art books and you're looking at them going, mm, yeah, I don't like that. You know, yeah. I, I, I yeah. wouldn't buy this book anymore. Uh -huh. You know, it's funny that it occurred to me. Um, I, I was looking at um, Toy Story 1 work versus the Toy Story 3 stuff. Uh, it was because it was all like a lot of pastels and stuff. I mean, that was obviously nobody was like really painting digitally then. If they were, they were on the edge of things. Um, but it was like it was all pastels and it was like it was fine obviously the beautiful work came from it right but it's like the art book is fine you know and then you get toy story 3 and everybody's just like it's polished and because they've probably been studying other art books and other artists and it just feels like the internal game has changed and people's standards have raised um even since you know that one i don't know it what happened especially mind. the lighting uh, there was yeah. especially oh, so a lot of thought right um, to the cinematography of the whole entire thing absolutely yeah and i'm sure like back then you're making the very first cg full-length feature animated movie mm -hmm. um you know a, a lot of those color scripts might have just been about that just about oh. color and, not, and it worked right right yeah you can't argue with the results it looks beautiful yeah and the, you go back even I further can. it's like the the layout designer uh finishes designing the layout well now you gotta paint the layouts <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the same person yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah i think it's just so funny like they didn't overwork it they did just as much work as you needed to make a beautiful end product and i think that's something i have to keep telling myself it's like sketchbooks shouldn't look perfect um you know I, I think that is a safe space to experiment and make your mistakes and so you can leave them behind for the end product i don't know it was just sort of i think that's where a lot of it comes from from my like whatever insecurity or whatever that is, I think it just becomes like a, uh, I think, I think you're just the only person. I think that's why a lot of artists just have that instinct is like, you're the only one who sees your worst work, you know, cause you just don't put it out there. I don't know. That, that's, it's something that I'm trying to work on, you know, like you hear from, like, I, I think it's something I try to mention on social media occasionally too, and like post some of the things that didn't go well um, or talk about it at least. And like saying like, you know, I really struggled with this thing today. Um, I just wasn't feeling like I was on my game and because I think it's important to talk about and especially for young artists I think it's good to again it's the same kind of thing but it's every day on your on your Instagram feed is it's like it's like the art book syndrome it's like if you see the film that looks so beautiful and the art book is, is good but it's not as polished as the thing it's like that's on your feed every day every every Instagram post is polished finished beautiful work and you don't necessarily see the sketches that went into that I think it's just sort of feeding it in like in real time into your brain that like, oh, my sketches aren't that good. I heard about something online where there's this celebrity that uh, posted a picture of her that wasn't the most flattering, but it's totally natural and it was no Photoshop. And she's mm -hmm. like trying to start this movement, no Photoshop. We yeah. should start a movement of like, you know, yeah. showing our shitty tr sketches. <laughs> our yeah, sh yeah. Shit hurt. I like to post my time lapse videos for that reason too. Um, I like seeing like some of my favorite ones are the ones where my sketches were bad, or I struggled and just kept redoing it, redoing it, redoing it. I think like it's easy to lose momentum on those though, <laughs> so it's like I don't always love looking back on those because it just it felt like a battle to get the end product done. But I think that's important. I think like if the idea is important enough for you to finish it and struggle through it, I think that's it's worth showing those, especially because they were hard. You know the one. Like, who cares? The other interesting thing that I keep thinking about is um, whether whether or not uh, your decision to leave your job and pursue, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you said the animation industry, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping like I just moved to Glendale specifically to be closer to the studio so that I can, you know, have a shorter commute. It's sort of me tricking myself into uh following through, I suppose. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, the thing that's going through my head is okay, you got this person that's making this transition after fourteen years at a studio, which nowadays is it's quite a long time, uh, even though you're still young. And so that move something our grandparents used to do, you know? Right. That long at a studio. It's like you it's not you don't hear about that anymore. Well, I think maybe like over twenty years that's that that becomes definitely yeah. very rare. Yeah. Um, but what I'm kind of getting at is w- was it how do I kind of word this? Because what I'm really thinking about is complacency a lot of times doesn't make us you know get up and move. Right. And yeah. a lot of times, even though we might not be in our dream spot, it's not a bad spot. It's a pretty good spot. I, I, I have nothing bad to say about Elastic. I love it. it. It's like it's not that it's a problem with Elastic that I'm leaving. It's just sort of I think I need a new challenge. I think that's a big part of it. I totally get it. And yeah. what I'm searching for is when did this voice in your head start popping up when you first kind of when you could first remember that voice popping up and going, you know, I think we should do movies. Mm-hmm. Was that um, a long time ago and got stronger and stronger over the years or it's always been in the background for sure. Oh, yeah. okay. It, it, like, I think, you know, like part of the reason, like I said, I, you know, going back to Jurassic park and toy story, I think those were like two of the big ones for me. Um, was, uh, and of course, like being a long time Disney and Warner brothers fan and everything else. Um, it's just always been part of my, my interest. Um, I, there was always this sense of um, being attracted to the industry. I think when I moved to LA, my my uh, before I ever landed at Eight Five Two. Although, by the way, that was only within like a week and a half of moving to LA, which was very lucky. Um, the uh, I always had this this fantasy of like driving to the studio and like saying hi to the to the. To the guard at the you know entrance and then like driving up through the back lots i always had that like that fantasy version of, of la and it always seemed so romantic and so i think that never kind of left completely um i mean obviously now i know it's it's not that that's that's like such a simplified version of a thing but i think there was always this sense of i think really what it, be, what it came down to most recently uh, it's always been an interest but i think commercial work is exciting and varied and fast pace and you get so much variety from job to job that I think it really sharpens your skills. You know, I think like, I think that's why I have the range I have. I think I've got like, you know, my personal work, you don't see it. I I can do anything anybody asks pretty much because I have to be a bit of an artistic chameleon to satisfy the needs of, you know, Lexus and Nike and Marvel and Warner Brothers and, you know, all these and like, um, you can do cartoony kind of mid-century flat stuff, 2D stuff, 3D stuff. It's like you have to be able to do all that stuff because you work at a studio that has a wide variety of clients. So I think that was an incredible like boot camp um, to like make me a great artist. I, I, I think that I have to credit Elastic for so much of my skill for that. Um, but then at the same time, now you're kind of a mile wide and an inch deep. And I want to go deeper in storytelling and like those few tastes we've had of like short films and, you know, like kind of like shorter promotional films, like the Fantastic Beast stuff and things like that is like, you only get to tell like a 90 second story, maybe a couple minutes tops. Um, and it's rare, you know, I want to tell deeper stories. I want to develop characters. We, you know, we, if, even for like a 30 second spot, I'm picturing backstories of these characters. Cause that's the only way I know how to do it. Like I have to like, imagine a little bit about who they are in order to design their costume, you know, or design their, their wardrobe and figure out what their face looks like. I think I have to know a little bit of, at least, at least just bullet point backstory for me to hang it on something. And so like, you know, you have all that, you have to just kind of like leave on the table because you only have 30 seconds. You're not really going to explore that character's motivations on screen a whole lot. So I want to go deeper. I want to tell longer form stories and like develop characters and motivations that feel natural, like over the course of, a film, I think, is is, or or TV as well. I think is where I want to be. You know, just for that reason, just to get the biggest contrast and develop things more deeply than I was able to in commercial work. And do you have like an ultimate goal for animated feature work? Oh, like as a studio, or, or like what, or the role, or anything? The role that you're, the role that you would like to eventually get into. 
Um, I, you know, I'm an art director now. I mean, it's easy to say I want to be an art director for films, but I think that's um, it's presumptuous at this stage, of course, getting into a new, new industry. I have a lot to learn, you know, for sure. You know, I think I'm probably more ready than I think a lot of studio people think a commercial artist might be ready because they don't have like the no, totally. exact uh, yeah. one to one, you know. I'm talking about um, ultimate artistic goal, you know, in the yeah. animation. Uh, I'd love to work. I'd love to work for Disney. I, I think like a Disney feature would be really exciting. Um, I think if I had to point to anybody's career, if I had to steal their career, um, would be Corey Loftus probably. Um, I, I mean, you know, who doesn't? Of course, he's just he's uh, he's a bit of a yeah. I just I love his work. I love his like sense of humor, and, and, I, and I also like you can. It's evident in the books how he works with his team, and I think that's really exciting. I try. I take pride in you know nobody gets into into the job to be a, a manager. <laughs> You know, but those management aspects of an art directing job are the day to day. You're not necessarily even drawing every day, and like on a you know good project you are, but like there's specific you know, different skills that you need as a manager. Absolutely. And it's something that I take pride in. You know, I think it's something that I've actually become. I don't know. It's I you know I've heard from a lot of people they like working with me. I hope that's true. I hope they're not just saying that's my face. Um, but I I have a good time on my jobs. You know when things, you know, and, and I think I'm pretty good at getting ourselves out of jams as well. Um, I like working with people a lot. I think that's one thing that I really enjoy about CG and and film or, you know, whatever it is, animation and things. It's so much of a collaboration that, like, I don't see myself as, like, um, I like aiming a lot of voices at one target. I think that's really exciting and keeping people uh, motivated and on a clear path and leaving room for them to experiment and express themselves. I think it's so important because I've had great mentors in my life who've done that for me. And it's like, like Andy Hall in particular is a director I work with most at Elastic. He's been incredible. Um, and he's taught me a lot about how to be a good leader, I think, because um, he trusted me a lot and has given me a lot of leeway to, to lead these jobs the way I you know, think to do it. And Kirk Shantani is the head of CG at Elastic, and he's also very good at this. Uh, but it's something I take a lot of pride in. It's something that I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not just like making cool art and then letting people figure it out. It's that like, you know, we're shepherding this thing through and we're all, you know, aiming for this one goal. I think that team aspect is really cool. So see, to see Corey Loftus, just to connect it, um, it seems like, you know, obviously I don't, I haven't worked with him, but like, it seems like he's really good with his team. Those little sketches and drawers and things are really funny and like, you know, when I'm sure when a job gets hard and you just get get another note, it's easy to kind of like eh, another one of these. But it like, you know, he's got little cartoons and little doodles on things. It's got to be enough just to lift people up and and keep them, you know, moving ahead enthusiastically. It seems. So. Yeah. That's at least from the outside. That's the way it seems to me. So I, I think that's. I know it's an odd thing to sort of idolize about him, but I think that is something that I really appreciate. His work is beautiful, of course. Everybody can see that, but I think. That was something I really keyed in on. Is that like I like the way he seems to lead his team? I think. No, oh, it's very interesting. Um, where, where did you kind of get your education with art? Like, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Ohio. Um, my dad was in. Um, he was a creative director at an ad agency mm -hmm. uh, over in the area. Um, did he teach I you a lot about the industry? He was always, um, we were always sketching and stuff, of course, you know, the way, uh, and my mom was actually very artistic too. Um, but they, my dad was, you know, we were doing master copies. We were, he was teaching me perspectives like years before I ever learned it in school. Um, all that kind of stuff, like the training and, and kind of just having a, helping calibrate my eye to learning, I think, you know, on my own, I think it was really important. I'm not just getting it all out of art classes in school, uh, which were almost like craft time. You know what I mean? Like I was, we were going deep early doing eye studies and like mouth studies and, and anatomy kind of basics early on. That was, he was there for a lot of that. Do um, you remember the, ever hating it? Anymore? I loved it. I was proud of it. You know, it was, it felt like, um, I don't know. It felt like an art training montage if there was ever such a thing, you know, like it was, I was always good. I was always the best in school. Um, but like I was, but I earned it, you know, like where, kids were like playing sports and like practicing, practicing. I was doing that same thing. I was taking that same mentality to it and saying like, this is what I love. I want to be great at it. I'm not just going to like 
just doodle every day. I mean, I did, you know, it was of course mostly just sketchbooking and goof around. Um, but yeah, I mean, like doing like art books and, and I was voracious for that kind of stuff. And I think that was important, you know, that was, and it was something that, um, and he would set up still lives for me to do, you know, like as, I, as you're learning um, composition, I guess, it, it's easy to sort of just like put a jumble of stuff and not know why you're putting it there. So you'd help set up still lives to, and like teach me this is why you put things here. And, um, so there was always like helping, but teaching at the same time. Um, but actually, so when I was 16, I uh, um, got a job. The uh, Commons Art Shops came to our high school, high school, and uh, they did like a character demo, and they uh, recruited me from that thing. So I went and worked for them briefly. Uh, and unfortunately, the family card didn't work out, and so I had to give up my my job at SeaWorld doing uh, caricatures after only a couple of weeks. Uh, they were not happy about it, but. The best thing that happened out of that was I ended up interning with my dad at 16 uh, at his ad agency. And so that was like, I was, so basically I've been working for 18 years professionally, you know, or no, more than that. What is it? 20, I'm bad at math. Anyway, since I was 16, um, I've been working professionally as an artist, more or less. How old are you now? That, uh, I'm 37. Okay. Yeah, that's, so, that's a, that's a while. 21 yeah. years. So it, the um, yeah, so that's always been an important part of of my career has always been the professional aspect um, and learning how to work in a team and in a studio and with with people older than you, you know, especially when you're 16. It, you know, um, I was you know I had a lot to learn, but I had skills. I, I'd been working on computer and stuff like Illustrator and Photoshop because my dad would bring that home from the studio or from the from his agency. And so I just had it, you know, I was learning digital stuff early on. But um, so there was always a, like just this weird, like, you know, I interned there and then went to another studio and um, and then it came back to caricatures like it, through high, uh, like college. Mostly I worked as like a uh, for another character place. Where'd you go like to college? college? I went to Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. I, I studied uh, media studies there, time based media studies, which is what I think they have an animation program now. But at the time it was. Um, the animation program was in that, along with like film and photography and, and things like that. Two yeah. D and three D were all kind of on the same same floor, you know. Who is some of the other like really well known uh, artists that came from there? Yeah, um, uh, Ryan Green and Fawn uh, Verisanthorn actually went to school with them. They're story artists at Disney. Um, they uh, those are those are the two that come uh, come to mind. They're they're incredibly talented, and they they were then too. Um, but they, uh, only a handful of us came out to LA and, and like some people tried and left. Um, but I think those are two who obviously did very well for themselves. Um, ran into them at a, at a convention a couple of years back and, you know, I, it's funny cause like you'll see their caricatures in like the Disney character, uh, events or whatever they do. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, I know this too. Cause they're like, Ryan's very tall and Fawn's, you know, uh, petite and like, they just, of course they're, they're just begging to be caricatured. So it always made me laugh. It's like, and you can pick them out from a crowd a million miles away. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah. so now uh, that you're making this transition, mm -hmm. you said this is kind of like a long transition. Uh, yeah, sort of. So, like, um, it's it's probably a funny exit. Uh, the uh, I put in my notice. Um, I put in like a thirty day notice or whatever it was. Uh, this is a couple months ago. Um, Currently, so <laughs> it's a funny thing to describe, I guess, but like uh, our managing director, uh, Jen Sophia Hall, is, you know, I've been working with her for years. Um, and like I said, everybody at work is like family. They, they've been incredibly supportive. Um, it was hard for them to hear it, hard for me to say it, you know, to, to, uh, to tell them it was time to go. But um, they understood. I think they saw it coming, honestly. <laughs> I don't know if it was anything in particular, but I think they saw it coming. Um, obviously moving to Glendale is part of it and, you know, doing conventions. And frankly, I'm just having a bit of a moment. I mean, the fact that you uh, want to talk is exciting for me and I'm in a couple magazines right now and uh, there's just stuff going on. So like, it seems like I reached, I passed some kind of uh, marker, whatever that is. Um, but so I think they were just maybe reading the tea leaves, but um, Jen, uh, like I basically I intended to quit and just take some time off and look and, you know, with commercial work as it is, you have like these long bookings, these like kind of couple month 
long projects and it's like you can't really leave in the middle of those so i was only looking you know in short little gaps and it you know it just didn't i couldn't quite line it up and i was like i think i just have to quit to have an open time to look and take the right thing when it arrives and i was like doing the math i was like here's how long i can do this uh, before i just run out of money <laughs> um and i was okay but jen kind of counter offered said hey like why don't you come back to work um keep your insurance and everything else and then you get to and when the right job comes by you can turn down the things that you don't have to take like um an okay job out of desperation you can wait for that perfect job so that's what i'm doing right now i'm actually on a sabbatical right now I'm on my last week of a sabbatical i'm running out most of my vacation time just to get a break and work on um projects launching my new brushes and working on some tutorials and articles and things like that so i'm trying to like it's been a busy working break but it's been really um helpful it's been really it's been good rest but i feel energized creatively again after a long move and a lot of creative or you know professional sort of just tumult so it's been fun to take a little bit of a break and then we're going back to work next week and you know if if the right job offer came up next week i'm ready to take it but it's it's so it's an odd position to be in with them but it's so nice that they would want to support and right kind on. Of go on with yeah, your journey with before them. we get on you know a little too far um you were mentioning that you were working on brushes i definitely want to yeah. mention that what are max packs maybe you can max explain packs. um that was such a funny thing it was uh i i enjoy procreate on the ipad quite a bit it's a, the painting app that i use i've been using it for years before the apple pencil made it great um it was a good program before and i used like a little stylus and stuff so i've been using it for years but it was just i always liked the idea i like to draw at coffee shops and stuff and bars and and just out in the world i like being away from my desk because i feel like sitting at my desk feels like work and i'm kind of in a different mindset so on procreate you can just paint from the couch or out in the world and do characters and studies of people, whatever it is, cafe sketches and things. Um, but I really enjoy kind of being mobile. And so when the iPad came out with like the Apple Pencil, it was so good and so satisfying to use that I ended up using, um, I made my own brushes because I just didn't quite find what I was looking for in the program. Um, so I've been using them for a couple of years and people were like, where can I get these brushes? And I decided to start selling them. Um, and they kind of just took off. And so all of a sudden now I'm like at the center of this funny little uh, community of Procreate people. Um, and I've got a relationship with Procreate right now, in fact, and they've been lovely. Um, they, uh, they've just been incredible. Like I, they commissioned me to do a piece for their, uh, one of their recent launches. Um, it's just been so exciting. So I like this uh, gouache pack that just launched, uh, I don't know, a week and a half ago. It's doing really well. And it's just such an honor to be part of people's creative processes. Um, it's such a weird slot to to live in someone's creative life. I don't know. It's such a funny um, thing to have that uh, sort of objective bond. If they don't like my work, they can still enjoy my brushes. And I think it's helped me, you know, meet new people in the industry. Um, it's just been really exciting. It's been it like I don't know. It's I'm so grateful for the trust that people put in my in my tools. It's been really fun. I don't even get like I I use Procreate. Um, I use a desktop mostly for for most sure. of my art. So I don't even get like how do you go about making your own brushes and then selling them? <laughs> um, Gumroad is where I sell them. Uh, making them, it's kind of like making Photoshop brushes. I think it's easier than making Photoshop brushes. Sort of, it's different. Um, but I think it's much more intuitive. I've made Photoshop brushes in the past. But you I make them really... in Procreate and then you yeah, export it, them. Yeah, exactly. So you can switch, you know, brush tips and change the grain and, you know, how it reacts to pressure and things like that. And like tilt actions, you know, so you can make it like dry brush on the, t on, on the tilt action. Um, so you can do all these different things with it. Um, and it's just, honestly, it's just fiddling with sliders and making tips and grains and things. It's a little bit nerdy and, and, analytical and kind of, um, but then it's just a lot of testing and tweaking and testing and tweaking. And the, the squash pack took me 11 months, so it's been a long time coming. This one was a hard one. Um, it shows in the pack. I, I think it's the best one yet. I, I'm hearing from people that they think the same. So that's exciting. Well, definitely look up Max Packs and yes. get all of them, test them all out, try them yeah. with your Procreate. And Procreate, of course, is uh, their, our biggest sponsor for Lightbox Expo. That's right. Yeah. And with Lightbox, they're such an amazing company too. I, I really 
like uh, they're not paying me to say this. I just really enjoy working with them. They've been really cool. And I think like it's evident in the product. They're just really innovative and they're exciting. I think they're Photoshop without the bloat for me is what I tend to think of them as. I just really love their 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 drawing app. That's what I use for almost all my personal stuff these days. Great people, great program. Uh, yeah. What I was going to mention is that with Lightbox Expo, a lot of the sponsorship money that we get, we actually give it back to the artists. So we ask the sponsors, yeah, pick you know, X amount of artists, and uh, those people are not going to have to pay for their tables anymore, right? And of course, Procreate knows of you and knows of your work, and they picked you as one of the tables that they want to sponsor. So con really congrats sweet, yeah. about that. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, it was, it was very exciting to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome because they, you know, they love the idea of giving back to the artists, but all, as well, like uh, making it kind of like a thing with all this, you know, with all the sponsors of Lightbox kind of putting it into the sponsorship that they would be giving some of that back to the artists. Uh, that was like a big, important part for us about creating the event. Yeah, I think that's so incredibly generous. And it's also like, you know, these sponsors couldn't do what they do without the artists anyway. So I think it's such a great way of, of merging um, motivations. I think it's so, so great, mutually beneficial. Absolutely. Um, now, we were talking you know, about a lot of stuff, but I want to talk a bit more about your art specifically. Sure. Okay, so I do notice that in at least the painting videos that I've seen, you start straight from color. Uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm getting into color. Yeah, I don't do like the, the grayscale thing as much. I, I find that a little bit too disconnected for me. I, I just, I think it's also partially procreate, don't do like the gradient mapping tools that is often employed in Photoshop when you're doing that kind of stuff. Um, I use it sometimes, you know, like it's, it, it'll come up occasionally, but it's pretty rare for me. Yeah. It doesn't come as naturally to me. Plus I tend to look for kind of a traditional uh, aesthetic. I want to make sure my, you know, I sell brushes. So like, I want to make sure my brushes look like paint. You know, I want to make sure I'm painting like a painter would. Um, and in part just to sell the brushes. And it's also just good practice for me. I think I, I want to try to bridge the gap between digital and traditional to a certain extent. I think that's a, way I tend to try to do that. Well, it looks awesome. Um, and so you kind of go from loose sketch to block in back to uh, tightening up the sketch as you mm -hmm. start to finagle the painting and trying to wrangle it to its completion, right? Yeah. Now, I also noticed that uh, at least in one of the videos I've seen, you have a sphere there. Yeah, yeah. Right. And the sphere yeah. is, you know, has certain lighting on it and things like that. <clears throat> the one that I'm thinking of specifically is, I believe it's a Viking. Yep. You caught this big, big fish. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the the process, the thinking, the purpose of the, the sphere? Yeah. Um, so I think in that one in particular, so I think with skin, I'll do that more with skin than like hard surfaces because I, um, I'll use like a, a kind of like a multiply uh, lighting layer. A lot of times I'll do local color and lighting separately, at least early, loosely, to like kind of get my palette and work out my ideas, and then I'll paint over it usually. Um, skin is one of those places where I don't think that works very well. Um, I think it's it's an okay base to start from, but I think just the subsurface qualities of skin and the, the specular qualities of skin just tend to like break the, the normal... Um, you know, easy sort of like multiply blue on top of things. You know, I think that's a quick way to make people look like they're made of clay and just look chalky and gross, uh, and it distorts the colors too much. So I think w with the sphere, I was trying to work out my idea for, um, I like to do like a cool highlight and a warm shadow, and that was a way of me just kind of working out those ideas. And I wanted to, especially because he was like, he's like standing in ice, and so he had like some really strong green underlight and like a cool top light and then like warm in the middle. And that was like a funny um, combination of things that I just, I just wanted to thumbnail and kind of work out in a way that I could then reference and just have it as kind of just like a, um, you know, like a color palette, but just 
you know, sitting there to reference. And he had a big round belly, so it was good to, like, figure out the angles, and I could kind of keep checking in on that. So, so for that was- those of you that can't see or don't know what we're talking about, sure. uh, this sphere is placed in the illustration. It's moved around a couple of times, probably to help. <clears throat> As I'm zoomed in, like, it's near the face, it's near the belly, or wherever it is I'm working. Wherever yeah. you're painting, yeah. yeah. And the sphere is pretty much like you painted it thinking like a big ball of skin. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. Gross, yeah. But yes. Right. And then <laughs> you have the uh, the reflective light from the water. So then you have mm-hmm. this way you can look at the, the sphere and go, okay, well, how is this reflective light, this, this very greenish blue water going to reflect onto this, this skin sphere? Yeah. And then you would use those rela- relationships and paint the guy yeah so at some point i'm just sampling color from it but it's good just to see it's nice to i think it's easy to sort of lose track of where that is or where your light direction is coming from you know it's easy to sort of evolve your color palette without referencing um where you started i think you know like it's easy for that green to kind of migrate into blue or migrate into yellow if you're just kind of referencing randomly um so it's just a good reminder i don't do do it on every i pick do you eye drop as well yeah you would yeah that's where i was going with a lot of that yeah see i used to do that except i would add in a three-dimensional um arrow that would draw in right and that would also be the light and then i would i would paint a little cube underneath my sphere oh i have another reference that's cool i hadn't thought about that i like that too yeah, I, I like to do it occasionally. I, you know, I work as a 3D lighter too, so I think I can. It's it's sort of in my brain to to think in three dimensions like that, and to kind of like be very analytical about light direction and where shadows fall. It taught me, you know, how to do some of that stuff too. You know, like I composite a bit too. So like I, on complex pieces, I'll actually paint the way I would composite a 3D piece. I'll do passes, like I'll do you know, local color and lighting and. Uh, ambient occlusion and specularity and reflections and stuff. I, I don't do it all the time, but when something calls for it, you know, when you're really in a jam and you have to describe materials in a very specific way, um, it's a nice way to work. I mean, it's a little crazy, but it tends to be the way to, to do it for me anyway. But it's it, it's hard to like reverse engineer that knowledge into anything that people would appreciate, but it's it's uh, if you've worked in CG, it makes a lot of sense. It's awesome how all these things, like you were saying, uh, very shallow water, a uh, very wide, I forget the term, lake or well, something. Well, an inch deep, yeah. Right. And how all these things are now uh, kind of like Voltron coming together yep. to build yeah. this whole new career that you're going to build. I mean, like, I've got, you can see caricature, you can see logo design, you can see, um, or you know, graphic design, you can see uh, a lot of CG influence. There's, there's a lot of different... Um, I wanted to be a car designer for a minute. I wanted to be a comic book artist for a minute. There's all these different interests that I think have like, you know, I'm, I'm this weird, uh, you know, mashup of all these different things. And it comes out in different ways, like different pieces will look like they'll pull from more from one influence or another, you know. It's interesting that you use the word mashup because I was thinking also like, uh, of course, we are influenced by everything around mm-hmm. us and all these different artists, our lives, our family, whatever. Uh, but if you kind of, kind of had to point to a few artists, a few artists that maybe um, had a bit more influence than other artists onto your art, who would those people be? Oh, man. It's such a hard, I mean, like, obviously I mentioned my dad. Uh, he's, he's a major part of it, I think, you know, especially early. Um, I, you know, it's so hard to even say. I, so much of, of I really I, I, lately I've been studying uh, gouache people because I was making my gouache packs. So I'm looking at a lot of Nathan Fox, whose work I like a lot. His color work is unbelievable. It's just so pretty. Uh, his videos with you have been great. Um, and then uh, James Gurney is also really fun to watch for me. I like his landscape paintings and you know his Dinotopia stuff was really cool back in the day. And it was interesting to like I started following him for his his uh, gouache and casein paintings and things recently or, you know, years ago, but semi-recently in my artistic career. And then to realize that he was the Dinotopia guy, I'm like, oh, cool, there's, you know, because I really enjoyed those when I was younger, too. Um, and then uh, Julian Tutino Tedesco is an artist I really enjoy, um, comic, comic book cover artist. Um, he's been really, um, he's, like like I said, these are all sort of gouache-influenced 
Uh, no, totally. And, can I can I just stop you for a second, Max? Sorry, but um, what I was really curious about is when you look at the style of your work. Oh, sure. Um, I just funny because I don't know that there there's like a lot of uh, mid century artists that I think played in in uh, like a little while back. That's what I was um, kind of yeah. Like I, I yeah. What I was searching for is I felt like there's some artists in there that you wouldn't really see the connection because, of course, your stuff would look completely different. Yeah. yeah. But just some interesting, you know, um, artists that influenced your style. I, it's funny. I don't know if I could point to anybody in particular. I tend to have I have like inspiration galleries that I just Absolutely. Kind of pull random stuff from. So it's like I don't even know how to like point it in any one direction. But there was a lot of like mid-century cartoon modern um roots to a lot of that or to like i think where my work has ended up i think it's somewhere between like comic book and mid-century if you could find whatever weird uh combination that is i think that has sort of led to like going for big shapes and kind of unusual caricature and obviously caricature has been a major part um i don't know it's it like i think I, i'm really attracted to mid-century art generally cartoon modern in particular and, and like i think you can see some of that there's also like uh I think color wise, I look at impressionists a lot as well. Um, like Monet has been a, you know, is someone I reference for uh, color work and, and some of the where he does his values and things. Like his Rouen castle stuff is amazing, uh, or cathedral stuff is incredible. Um, I don't know. It's, I, I, I think I've, <laughs> I, I know it's not a very satisfying answer, but I can't say that I pointed to very specific artists at points in my career. Actually, like, I thought the answer was yeah. awesome. I okay. I was totally, you know, because uh, I didn't think that you would say anybody where I would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that stuff looks just sure. like Max's yeah. stuff, right? And and for me, when I was asked this question years ago, um, one of the people I said was Sergio Aragones from yes. Mad Magazine, right? Amazing, yeah. yeah. And my stuff does not look like Sergio's at all. Right. But the thing that I really got from him was um, his humor. Everything that he did was so universal. You didn't have to yeah. be a part of some certain culture or you know, live in a certain place to understand that humor. Everybody yeah. got it. It was very universal. So that's the thing that made me go, oh, yeah, I really want that in my art mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. You know, so w what you said about Impressionist, Monet, I was like, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's also like Maurice Nobles in there too, um, like background uh, designer for Warner Brothers. Uh, you know, in the what 30s or whatever. Um, his work is, I, I I appreciate it as a kid, but I didn't just because I remember it was just felt different, felt more elevated and classy. I don't know. There's there's I, I didn't have the words for it as a kid, but of course now I understand that's just unbelievably innovative and and efficient in the way that only cartoon modern I think has captured. Um, just like making their limitations their uh, what they celebrate and, and exaggerate. And I always thought that was really cool. Now, some people, they come out of school and they go straight for their goals, right? Some yeah. people come out of school, they don't really know what their goals are and they try different things and slowly but surely perhaps they get there. Mm -hmm. um, now, Myself included, I went to business school before I went to art school. Yeah, yeah. Right, but do I regret it? No, because you wouldn't be the artist you are, and 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 you have your position in the community without that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I guess I was just gonna ask you pretty much what you just kind of answered, which was, why wouldn't you regret it? Right. And obviously, you're yeah. using all of your experiences now. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's funny because, like, you know, it's so hard to, like, I wouldn't recommend my career to anybody the way it is now. I mean, I, no regrets, like I said, no regrets. But the, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody stay anywhere for 14 years. <laughs> I think that seems kind of odd, and I, it's worked fine for me. You know, I think it's, it's taught me, I think having that, having a safe place to experiment and grow my skills and having that personal relationship with, trusted creative advisors and and a team that i fundamentally like fully trust is like i think it leads to amazing work and it allowed me to experiment and become a director a bit and 
the art direct and, and do more and more varied, um, take more risks, I think, creatively, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so, like, I've, able, I've been able to, like, evolve my career in a way that I don't know that I would have had the ability to if I jumped straight for studios straight off the bat. I think commercial work, you have to be so nimble and so flexible that it made me, it definitely advanced my skills, I think, faster than I would have if I had been at a studio. I think I'm ready for studio work now because I think I have a good foundation. I don't, I think I would have regretted aiming for, not regretted, but I, I wouldn't be the artist I am if I had been um, kind of, I don't say this in, in a negative way, I think studios have a, a size problem and they need to like put people in boxes, right? It's just the natural way of things. You have to have a pretty um, specific uh, hierarchy or, or whatever it is. And so I think it ends up making, you can only kind of do one aspect of one thing. I wear a lot of hats at work and I love that aspect of it. I can model, I can sculpt maquettes of my characters and um, do texturing and lighting and you know do all these different things and then lead teams and be involved in so many different things that I it doesn't get old for me. So 14 years didn't feel um, like a slog at all. It just became new adventures on every project. You know, and, and when, a, when a project is great, it's over too soon, but when a project is bad, it's over quickly and you're not on a bad film for a year and a half or whatever it is, you know. So I think there's, you know, it's, it's just a different kind of thing, but I think a lot, I hear a lot of young artists will do like school visits at, at the office and uh, everybody wants to get into film. And I understand why, because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting, it's prestigious, but the, uh, I think commercial work is a great, great place to learn and hone your skills and figure out what you like. I don't think anybody, I wanted to be an animator when I came out to LA. I thought I was gonna be an animator because I like it, but I think I think I ended up where my career, I think I found the level for my career. I think it feels right to me. It feels like a natural place for me to be. It'll probably feel uh, like slow motion when you get into, uh, you know, cause now you're yeah. making, you know, this 90 minute commercial for three, four <laughs> years. Absolutely. And you're gonna be like, Let's make some decisions. Let's go, people. Let's, yeah. We could have so finished this yesterday. I think the grass is always greener, right? Because it's it's so abbreviated. We have like a couple weeks to do all that stuff in a commercial, you know. So it's like I, I don't know where the medium is on, is on that, but uh, I think now I feel more confident in my work um, personally. So I have always I always have that to fall back on. Just scratch the itch. Well, the other know? thing I was going to mention uh, is that uh, perhaps Lightbox can help you with. Uh, this next chapter of your career, because one of the oh, things yeah. that we're doing is uh, every exhibitor, every presenter, every attendee will be welcome to upload their portfolio onto Lightbox. We're, right now we're working on a portfolio review program. So what's going to happen is the sponsors, all the uh, studios uh, that are sponsoring, they will access you know, this uh, portfolio review program, select the people that they would like to interview. That's great. Right. And help to connect the artists with the big studios. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, of course, I'm also saying that because it gives me a really good excuse to say that to get people to come to Lightbox Expo and, you know, upload their portfolios and such before Absolutely. the event and all that good stuff. Now, yeah. last question, Max, uh, sure. if you could have the chance to thank somebody from your past, who would he or she be and what did they teach you or you know, do for you. That was so special. Um, I already mentioned my dad, so I'll go with someone else on this. Um, my dad obviously had a major part in my creative upbringing, but I, I think I'd like to thank Charlotte Bellin uh, at CCAD, where I went to school. She was um, probably the person who helped me connect the dots um, more than any other professor at, in art school. I think she was, um, she was a CG teacher. She's now chair of the animation department at CCD. Um, but man, she she's an incredible talent and an unbelievable teacher, but she was one of those people, like with a friend, I was always, um, we were making shorts when people weren't really doing that. We were kind of trying to overachieve, I suppose, or overstretch ourselves or something. She was the person who, you know, we'd show her sketches of what we're trying to do. And she's like, no, you can do better. You can push it more and you can employ these skills that you're developing in these other classes. Um, like, you know, use these fundamentals that you gained from, you know, your graphic design classes. Use the color skills you're getting from your painting classes. And it was like, 
it's so obvious, I suppose. And I don't, but like, she helped me put it all together. I think it was the first time I realized like the funnel could be kind of employed more actively. And I wasn't just feeding my, my instincts. It was like, of course I have to like push harder and harder and harder. Um, it, it, it sort of found like formed the, the like the active part of my brain that is more analytical and a little bit more, um, I don't know. She's kind of like, I, there, there were a couple of conversations I had with her where, that I kind of referenced in my head. Um, that I'm like, this is, this could be better. This could be more pushed. This could have more charm, this, you know, whatever, you know, aiming for appeal and, and uh, yeah, just questioning uh, the choices you made. I think there, there were just a few like key conversations and she's been incredibly lovely and I've had the, you know, I, I've stayed in contact a little bit with her over the years and spoken to her classes and for real, I think there, she's probably the most important uh, teacher I had outside my family, you know, individually. She was incredible. And she does these like beautiful ink uh, drawings and I think she's gonna be doing a, uh, a class with you guys too, a workshop with you guys. That's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you, Max, for spending some time with me, and I uh, can't wait to see you at Lightbox. And for those that also want to come to Lightbox, another couple of great reasons is because, you know, you mentioned Toy Story 3, how you love the art book. Well, Dai Satsumi, the art director for the color scripts for Toy Story 3, all those beautiful paintings. He's coming. Of course, you mentioned Nathan Faux. He's coming. Pretty much... Uh, the whole art community is gathering in this one place. It's going to be awesome. 